Welcome, and we're going to be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Mrs. Zambito. Thank you. 
So with great honor and distinction, I'd like to present a certificate of appreciation and when you are called, please come up and definitely shake Mrs. Mayo and Dr. Video's hand and stand right here and have it be a great opportunity if you want to take a picture. So let's start it with Mariana Martinez.
So, uh, Mr. Howard, it was alluded to last month, I believe, we uh, did have feedback from the state on our most recent um, audit plan, the review, and we, as you know, came into the district in July 2015 uh, with 21 areas of non compliance. There were long standing areas of non compliance, and we're happy to report that as of today, we're down to seven. Those are fo primarily focused on two areas. One is the how we provide tutoring services for our suspended students and how we manage our functional behavioral assessments and positive behavior plans for students with behavior and the private school. So we have a plan for that and we're hoping that by June those seven will also come off the books. So just some updates on the continuum. We did make a pretty major shift across the district, as you know. Um, the feedback has been primarily positive. Um, and these are just some, some quick little positives that we've heard. Uh, teachers certainly uh, reporting that student groupings are very much more aligned. Uh, we had a lot of programs for a while where there was a wide range of learners, very difficult to provide coherent instructions when you have a very wide range. And that's not the case in the new continuum. Um, we see a, a much less movement of students from building to building as a student's program may change. Oftentimes that program is available in their building. They don't need to leave to another building to, to get that program. Um, we have provided a, a whole range of, of, of trainings, as has CI, and uh, there has been a lot of positive feedback on those trainings and the impact they've had on student learning. We did shift our 812s. We created two with Longville, and we have all of our students with autism in Meadowville. And so far, there has been a positive impact on our most challenged uh, learners in those, in those classrooms. And those programs have landed relatively nicely. Um, there's still work to be done there, but um, we're definitely pleased so far. And uh, the, there has been positivity in terms of the go teaching now being available in all nine elementary schools. There's been a little, you know, feedback at times that maybe we're moving a little too quickly um, in this change, but uh, you know, we're certainly working with teachers um, on, on that conversation. So. This is something that I'll just, uh, again, a re rehash of the slide in terms of the state has really emphasized inclusion and inclusive practices, that uh, a practice of putting kids into smaller classrooms and keeping them there for years is really not the way the state uh, wants us to go. And they're starting to monitor and, uh, and keep track of this at, at both a, a county and a state level. These are just two of the highlights that I had previously brought up in the past that kind of aligns to what I'm going to talk about this evening. One is the fact that instruction and configuration of classrooms and activities include both students with and without disabilities. There's an absolute expectation of law that our students with uh, special needs be included in a wide range of opportunities in our classrooms and our schools. And that special ed teachers and general ed teachers work and intentionally plan lessons to promote participation and progress of students with disabilities in learning and social activities. So one of the proposals I'm putting forward today speaks to the heart of that. We also talked about uh, a theory of action. I believe this was January of last year. Two of the bullets that we I pulled out of that that kind of speak to what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, that if we create more targeted inclusive opportunities in our continuum, then students with disabilities will have greater access to the general ed curriculum, improving success for all areas. Research shows that special ed students to often do much better when they're placed into general ed settings with supports. Um, and that segregation as a lifetime practice does not always lead to the intended outcomes that we want for our kids. And that part of that uh, ongoing transformation of the continuum, that we are uh, committed to increasing the number of co-teaching programs to ensure that they're available at every grade and every school. We've done that. We have co-teaching in the building, but we're talking tonight to enhance that. This is what our structure currently looks like. We took a measured approach to this. So you can see, for example, Metal Hill has full day co teaching kindergarten through fifth grade. New Winter has full day co teaching first through fifth grade. And the other seven buildings with K 5 programs have half day. They are supplemented in those half day programs with a teaching assistant who is in the room when the teacher has to then go to another classroom. So, for example, you have a a teacher who teaches kindergarten and first grade. They spend the morning in kindergarten, afternoon in first, and the TA flip-flops on um, the time when the teacher's not in that classroom. So we're looking to, to, to ramp this up a bit. To do that is a challenge, and I'll kind of break it down for you as to why that's a challenge. So we can go to the next slide. So this is something we've already brought forward to the Exceptional Learners Committee. Um, in order to fully staff full day co-teaching kindergarten through fifth grade, 
you would need 54 teachers to do so. We currently have 32 teachers dedicated to cook teaching in Newburgh, uh, K-5. So obviously 22 teachers is quite insurmountable, certainly in one year of the budget. And we're certainly not asking this evening for 22 teachers in Newburgh. Um, the uh, number of TAs supporting the current program is 21. You know that by the seven buildings that have half-time co-teaching, times three teaching assistants, so we have 21 um, uh, teaching assistants to support the co-teaching classrooms. And in a full-day structure, so at Meadow Hill and in, and, and in um, New Windsor, they do not have um, teaching assistants supporting the, the full-day co-teaching. They don't need that. So we know that that's too instrumental. So we're looking for something in between as sort of that three to five year plan. So we're offering tonight to the board for consideration and as part of the budget process is to have a half day integrated co teaching in kindergarten and first grade. And I can explain that some more. Maintain the current structure of full time TA in kindergarten. All our kindergarten classrooms currently have a full day teaching assistant as part of the kindergarten experience. And we're looking to supplement first grade with a full time TA as well. So you have a teacher who's split between both kindergarten and first, but they would have full day uh, teaching assistance in each of those grade levels to support all students, including the sessional learners, um, when the teacher is there as well as when the teacher is not. And then to support full-time co-teaching in second through fifth grade. In order to do that, you need 45 teachers. Um, again, it's, it's five teachers per building times nine buildings. Again, I had mentioned we have 32 teachers that are currently dedicated to co-teaching in Uber. And where we're going to look to make a shift is we currently have nine resource room teachers. That's all they primarily do in the building. They do other things in terms of maybe testing, um, some do ask, but predominantly their role is, is resource room. We're proposing that those resource room teachers get reappropriated into integrated co teaching. And to do that, that brings us to 41. Suddenly, we're a lot closer to full day co teaching by blending it in the way in which really the regulations require us to do. So if you do that, we're only four teachers short, we're not 22 teachers short. In terms of the support staff, which is our, our teaching assistants, again, the current ICT structure requires 21 teaching assistants. Um, in the new model that we're proposing, we only need nine. That would be for that for full day, to be full-time first grade. We would not need teaching assistants in the ICT classrooms second to fifth grade because we have a full-day teacher. Um, that would allow us to reduce the number of TA positions to 12. We need three of those positions because in the budget that will eventually evolve over the course of the next few months. We are recommending some additional middle school programs for some of our more challenged learners, and we do need teaching assistance to support those classrooms. So the net um, uh, reduction that we're looking for is nine, and those nine positions will be reduced by attrition. There will be no layoffs. So again, as part of the budget process, we're asking for an addition of three special education teachers. We're asking for the reduction of nine teaching assistants through attrition. And the cost of this new model, as well as some of the other proposed special education programs, will be offset by the reduction of TAs and will not result in no, in no layoffs. So it's a cost, relatively cost neutral proposal. It has some cost, but not at all, what seven teachers would cost. And I just put up there as sort of a bullet that we, you know, we're asking, we need four if you want to do it, but. We don't have a kindergarten currently in New Windsor, which, which means we're not going to have first grade co-teaching next year in New Windsor. So we're asking for one year not to have co-teaching in kindergarten and first grade in New Windsor, and then maybe we do that the following year. And we've already uh, talked to New Windsor about that. So that would need, mean that how we get from four teachers to three. I'm moving too fast, and I apologize. I'm, just, I'm trying to, to lay this out. Why this model? Again, it aligns to the uh, three to five year plan that we have already described to continue to enhance the special education continuum, targeted to instructional design improvements to positively impact progress and achievement of exceptional learners. While we would love a full day model K-5, like I said, we can't afford that in one year, but it does move us significantly forward in that area, and we know that full day co-teaching is, is a better model for our exceptional learners. Co-planning, which you saw in the, in, the, in, the, in the memorandum from State Ed, is one of the key ingredients. Uh, half day co-teaching, that could sometimes be a challenge, full day co-teaching you have those two teachers co-planning as well. They share the same lunch and the same prep time. They can go to the same vertical meeting, vertical team meetings, uh, horizontal team meetings, data meetings. They go as a group. So there's a lot more planning. 
um, and that it allows special educators to focus just on one grade level instead of being split in second grade through fifth grade um, across two. Um, and again, the research supports the model because, again, it benefits all students because you have additional hands in the classroom providing targeted instruction. The impact of the resource room, that's been one of the bigger questions. We have begun to at least let some of the teachers know we're considering this. And I did um, talk to Nancy Ed. Um, resource room as a pull-out model in English schools is antiquated. It does not reflect case law and the intention of IDA. It does make sense at the secondary level when you have departmentalized structure, you have students who need to go into a certain classroom, just like anything else at the elementary level, the, the, the instructions in the classroom. To have a student removed from that classroom for a period of time to go to another special ed teacher who may not have a direct line to that instruction just really isn't in keeping with where we are today and some of the case law. Students who require research from the elementary level will still receive that support, um, but that support will be delivered to the ICT teacher. So there will be time built in, something that uh, Sarah Felice and I have talked about. We've certainly talked to Linda Hatfield about trying to create some kind of RTI or intervention block for the day where that could be used for any kids, either in that classroom or the classrooms who might need a resource room experience. I just bring this up because people say, well, that doesn't, where are you getting this from? There was a 1983 court case, that's one of the maybe five or six court cases that lays the groundwork for least restrictive environment, and it talks about portability of service, and it pretty much says, you can read this on your own if you like, but it pretty much says that if a service can be provided in an integrated setting, in keeping with our already, it should be provided in a integrated setting. You shouldn't just pull kids out just because. So when given the choice between pull out or push in, we should always err on the side of push in. Um, and it was one of the sort of the ground, you know, one of the places that laid that groundwork for what we now describe as LRE. I also want to point out, this is a chart that kind of shows how resource room is used at the elementary level. Um, if you notice, it talks about kids who get just resource room only by school. Kids who get integrated co-teaching and resource room. Kids who get consultant teaching and resource room. And then the total. What you'll see is that like Guinea Avenue, Fostertown, Bellsgate, and New Windsor, and Yams, they use resource room because they don't have a full-time model. So they have kids half day, and they say, plus, well, we don't have a, they need more, so we're going to recommend another half hour of resource room. Well, if you move to full-time resource from second through fifth, you don't need to do that. And the majority of our students who are getting, pretty much all the students getting resource room at the elementary level of grade second through fifth. They're not getting it at the K-1 level. So um, it does allow them for us to not necessarily have to do what we're already doing, which is sort of backfilling supports for kids because they don't have the full day on. So that's the one. And that's for your consideration in terms of the, re the restructuring of ICT. We're also today uh, recommending the restructuring of our division. And again, what we have described is we felt that compliance was certainly a priority. Um, we have talked about the continuum shifts and monitoring those, and I think we've demonstrated today another way to go on that. But we do believe that the heart of what we do is instruction. And we um, are well aware of the fact that our teachers are craving support um, to continue to improve their efforts on behalf of kids. Um, anytime we sponsor any kind of professional development, they are, they are uh, more than, more than um, happy that we do so because, as they told us for many years, they felt they were not getting enough PD. So we need to spend more time with teachers around instructional um, practice for our special ed kids in these co-talk classrooms as well as others. So this is just a lot of words. Um, I'm not going to read through every one, but it does describe why we're trying to move this and the fact that we need to spend more time in the classroom. And we need to spend more time collaborating with CNI on those differentiated approaches to kids in those classrooms. So what we're recommending tonight is that in order to increase the focus on instruction, in addition to the other responsibilities under exceptional learning condition, we are proposing a reorganization. And again, this is a cost-neutral uh, reorg. Move from one director to two directors whose roles are differentiated by level. So we'll have a pre-K through fifth and a sixth through twelfth director. Currently, we have one director, as you know. We recently had Chris Coit be appointed as director of special education. We're now asking to have two. We currently have five supervisors of special ed, so we're asking to go from five to four. Um, so it's just a, a wash in terms of positions, but we'll just one uh, supervisor then being uh, translated into a director. We're asking for the creation of a pupil personnel facilitator as a teacher on special assignment. 
to support me with the day-to-day -day PPS responsibilities at the middle and high school level. And that position will be funded through 611. It's not a new position in the budget. Primarily, as you know, I've been asked now to do more of the guidance and counseling, to look at the K-12 uh, guidance plan, to further enhance the ambiance, to look at the ninth grade mentoring program, to work on fifth to sixth grade, eighth and ninth grade transitions, to make sure our kids are better prepared for college and have more opportunities around college and career readiness. Um, I'm certainly up for the challenge, but certainly having someone who is in the PPS world working with me and helping to do some of the day-to-day -day would certainly make it go um, a lot more efficiently. And we're looking to maintain the four CSC chairs that are currently uh, part of the structure. And again, the only cost would be the difference between the supervisor and the director position. It's a very large organizational chart, but it does describe sort of how it work. You have the two directors on the right working, supervising two supervisors, and then the CSC chairs and the principal staff under that. On the right, you can see left and right, and then uh, exceptional learners with me on the left, working with guys and counselors, the PPS facilitator, the nurses, and the nurse facilitator. Um, one of the things that would be somewhat different is certainly the delays for roles is that we'd be asking two directors to assume responsibility for supervise, supervision and evaluation of our psychologists, and our OTP team speech. Currently, I'm supervising and evaluating them. Um, as part of the many things I do, this new organizational reorganization allows them as directors to be the supervision and, super and evaluation of those, those particular areas. So this, again, I'm not going to read through these, but this sort of defines, and I'll well, certainly I'm going to provide an additional chart um, as part of the DOE week, weekly that would describe in more detail some of the uh, responsibilities of the director. Um, as well as supervisor and the PPA, PPS um, facilitator that's, that's outlined in the PowerPoint. So I am not going to read through all of these, but you certainly can, and if you have any questions, I'll certainly take them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierre. Um, I know you're joined by some people on your team, so if you just want to recognize them, we'll be neglected to recognize them. I'm going to be probably first thing first in the morning. <laughs> Jeff Chris Coyle is our Director of uh, Special Education. Uh, Rob Galapi, we'll have that. Supervisor of Special Education, Sasha Sullivan, joined us in August of last year. Supervisor of Special Education, we're back in the lands. Supervisor, and I can see Janet Allen, Janet Orway, who is our Supervisor of Special Education. Uh, Leroy, our, our nurse, uh, School nurse facilitator, I never get Seriously. right. Seriously. So, oh, health nurse facilitator. <laughs> visiting the school recently and I, I visited the classroom and the teacher said to me, you know, this is what we're doing with our inter integrated co-teaching and how we allow students to work in with each other. And he said, do me a favor. He said, pick out the ones in here who you think are, have IEPs. And, and I couldn't do it because it's really allowing the children to work together and bring them in an environment and it's really giving children an opportunity to have better self-esteem because I remember like I said, I'm a byproduct of the school district. I remember when there was a time when children who had those type of plans were in one classroom, and they kept them in one room, and it was a stigma attached to it. But I love the work that you're doing. I love the work that we said we were doing, a one, three, five year plan, and we're definitely on course. We still have ways to go, but we're getting there. And I just want to congratulate you. That team that we have sitting back there, incredible work. I gotta just keep saying, this is it's incredible. And one thing I like to say, Chris, I like the fact that you use case study case study to drive the work that we're doing here. And, and that shows that, you know, we're not doing it because this is what we do in Newburgh, no, we're doing it because this is what should be done with our children. And, and it's the most vulnerable population that we have. And, and it's a great job that you guys are doing. Just continue doing that work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to the entire team and division. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, so the next presentation is an introduction of the first draft of my budget. Give me a second, I'll transfer it. So 
members of the board, uh, our attorney, Mr. Shaw, and to our audience, uh, just good evening and, and thank you again. And to the entire exceptional members, thank you for all the work. And Mr. Forge, thank you for your leadership in that division as well. So while I'm here presenting tonight, I want you to understand that this is not the work of just myself. This is my entire team. Uh, we have spent countless hours uh, over the course of many weeks and months really thinking about what the plan of action was going to be for the upcoming school year. Uh, and so it's imperative that I note that you know, the work that we do around preparing the budget is ongoing. And so even though I'm presenting a draft to you tonight, there are still changes that I'm sure we'll have to make until the point I get to a finalized budget to present to you again. Uh, so tonight, I'll be presenting the first several slides, and then Mr. Kern will come up and present the second half of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Mr. McCoy is the designated clicker tonight. All right, so let's talk about this budget development and what we're calling an interactive uh, process. So I, I, it's important that I also note that, you know, this preparing the budget is very complex. It can be very nebulous. There are a lot of moving pieces, right? And so we want to make sure that our community and our Board of Education understands that this is a process that we begin with a thorough analysis right in the summer to prepare us for the upcoming school year. We have ongoing meetings with principals. They primarily, when it comes to the budget at this part of the year, are meeting with Mr. Kern and talking about the things that they believe they need in their, in their programs. He's going over uh, purchase orders and expenses and such. We have ongoing discussions with the Board of Ed at committee meetings. We provide opportunities for our, our Board of Ed members and our community to give feedback. And so that's whether it's here tonight and we have subsequent board meetings where, that are dedicated to board discussions or town halls or committee meetings. And the key thing to understand here is that the budget is a plan. It's a plan that is based on information that we have as of today. So none of us have a crystal ball, right? So we react based on new information that we get. So the governor released a budget, we know it's a proposal, and that it's going to be a final budget in the next month and a half or so. And so it's likely that we'll be getting some new information by way of hopefully additional funds to the district. That will result in more changes to, to the budget. So what does it reflect? Well, one of the key things that it reflects is the sustainability of programs. Right? So we have phenomenal programs in our district that we want to make sure continue in next year's budget. So whether that's ensuring that we have a plethora of honors and AP courses for students so that way they can thrive, making sure our needed students get the AIS services that they rightly deserve, Making sure we're, you know, putting in place enrichments uh, so that we all students can strive. Tomorrow, I hope you're able to join us. We're going to have Coco and Create as a way to celebrate the arts. Our digital convergence initiative, uh, I hope you're very familiar with. It's right in our vision 2020, the way forward. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around how to transform our school district to be in the 21st century. And we strongly believe in being lifelong learners. And so at the central office level, the school building level, and to the classroom, in our library, we want to make sure that our, our educators and our leaders are empowering themselves and taking advantage of the latest best practices. The budget also allows us to enhance programs. So tonight, I'll be highlighting quickly some new courses. Mr. Uh, Bear already highlighted the great work that's taking place with the Exceptional Learner Team. We need to continue to address another very needy population, and that's our English language learners, and make sure that we are absolutely doing right by them the same way we are for other students. And then we are scaling up our NFA West program. That is off to a good start. So I'm going to highlight some notable priorities. Uh, Mr. McCoy, can you scroll down just a little bit? All right, that's the first one. So in the next couple of slides, I'll be highlighting the pillar and what the uh, notable priority is in each of the pillars. So the first one is under pillar two, effective leadership. 
and that's Datacom. So one of the things I'm grateful of, of the board is the fact that you supported a common interim assessment across the entire district. And that's powerful because now we can compare apples to apples. In previous years, we had schools choosing various inter uh, interim assessments. And it was really hard to gauge how well fourth graders across the entire district were doing at ELA math, for example. Well, starting this year, we're now able to compare across districts across grades in ELA math. But what we're not able to do, uh, not to the level that we're satisfied with anyway, is that when we sit down with our principals and we start to analyze that data, we get them to report out on how well their schools are doing, we can't offer resources on the spot. And so our principals come to us and say, all right, my data is telling me this, and I wish I could be, uh, I, I wish I could offer this additional service to our students. I wish I could do this with our teachers. The allocation of funds to what we're calling Datacom will allow us to use real-time data on the spot throughout the year to support our school leaders with some of the challenges that they're having and not having to wait for another year for that to happen. The second notable uh, item around pillar two is the continuous investment in professional development for teachers and leaders. And one particular example of that would be around our, what we're calling the Digital Convergence Institute. So a few board meetings ago, this board passed uh, a resolution for us to have interactive whiteboards in every single classroom. And it's our goal to be able to launch the next school year with interactive whiteboards in every single classroom across the district. So that is a huge investment and a power move to transforming teaching and learning. In order for our teachers to feel comfortable using these interactive boards, we need to provide the professional development for them to do that. And so we're going to start that this spring. We're going to carry that professional development through the summer, fall, spring, and then another summer. So that way we touch every single teacher. And pillar three, under educational equity and out, uh, excellence, this board has made it very clear, and we are fully on the same page, that we have to invest early. Now, we understand that this is a payout that is many, many years down the road, but we're committed to supporting the primary years. And so you've done that in a number of ways. You've reduced class sizes in kindergarten. We hired more kindergarten teachers. We're doing a lot of impressive work in ENL and in special ed. This early investment will build on that. So what we're asking for is to expand the school year and expand the school day for children in, K in grades K1 and 2. So we're looking to expand their school year by two weeks, preferably in August, and then expand, extend their school day several times during the week in October, November, and December, and probably even on Saturdays. And this is to make sure that we're, we're getting kids uh, on grade level in math and in literacy by third grade. The other area for pillar three is multiple pathways to graduation. So in our committee, we talk to you about enhancing courses for CTE, specifically around emergency management. So that's a course that's slated to start in September. And then enhancing our, our nursing program by offering an LPM course, again, starting in September. Again, pillar three. So we've talked a lot about technology. We've talked a lot about this digital convergence. We've made some adjustments last year to how we use instructional technology facilitators, so ITFs for short. And one of the things that we knew last year was that we needed more technicians. So if we are truly to unleash our ITFs, so they can be in the classroom either co-planning, co-modeling, co-teaching, um, providing coaching supports on how to use these interactive whiteboards, how to use instructional software and devices, then we're gonna have to increase the number of technicians we have that can do the behind the work work. Right? So those individuals who are fixing computer cables and and fixing interactive boards and such. By allowing these um, micro technicians to do that will free up our ITFs to do the work that we need them to. The other item under pillar three is middle school redesign. 
So we have done a lot of high school redesign. We've invested early for our primary years. And so we're kind of bookending that work and moving towards the middle. So Mr. Forge and I have been working with the school leadership team at our middle school. We're going to continue to do that. But we understand that this can't be a quick fix. We have to get this right. So part of our phase one will be to start to redesign the middle school experience. Uh, and we're going to be working with the principals and the school leadership teams to start that work. And for the four, we have family community engagement. And so this is all around how do we support families and our community-based organizations with best practices from birth to three years old. So we certainly have enough evidence that shows that many of our scholars come in not prepared for uh, school-age experiences. And so just last week, I had the opportunity to uh, speak with world-renowned Harvard professor Ron Ferguson, who is willing to partner with the uh, school district around this concept of the Newberg Basics. And it's five best practices that we'll be able to support hospital, community-based organizations, and parents around, here's what you can do to get your child prepared for pre k and then the last one in the total five is multi-tiered level of support. So as I mentioned, the extended school day for students in the primary years, well, simply that's not enough. Right? So we need to make sure that we're providing additional opportunities for all students to have a rich experience in our after-school programs, as well as Saturday. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Kern to talk about the numbers. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Padilla, Madam President, members of the board, senior staff. And I can present the uh, numbers for the budget for the 2017-18 year. Uh, what we have here is a, a budget which has two sides to it. And like Dr. Padilla alluded to the expense sides of the budget, all the items that are in the budget, I have to say from this year, are in there for next year with a little bit of uh, uh, moving around and all the new ideas that uh, Dr. Padilla has talked about. Tonight we're going to concentrate on the revenue side of the budget. We put out a balanced budget of $267,100,000. It's about a $2.7 million increase over the current budget that we have, or a little over 1% on the percentage scale. There are three sources of revenue, major sources of revenue in the budget. State aid, as you see, is the largest part. We're just over 55%. That's up from this year here. Tax levy, the local property tax is the second one, a little over 42%. And then we have miscellaneous revenues, and we'll show some of those items a little bit later. But that accounts for only a little over 2% of the budget. State aid, we did a comparison from the current year of 16-17 to the new year of 17-18, uh, and we're up almost $3 million. And this is the governor's proposed budget. So things can change between now and the 1st of April when the uh, legislature is supposed to have the budget in. There doesn't seem to be anything happening that the budget's going to be late this year. Governor Cuomo has had on time budgets for the last several years, and he's very strict on that. This is the local tax levy. It's a tax cap calculation. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of factors that go into this calculation here. We start with the 2016-17 levy, which was the same as the 15-16 levy. We have a tax paid growth factor. This comes from the assessor's office in the state. And this tells us how much building for expansion in the community that we've had. And it's just under 1%. We add back in the pilots. Those are the payments and growth taxes. We have calculated $1.7 million for this year here. We take out the capital exclusions. These, this is the local share of the debt service. These are all the building programs that we've had in the district over the last couple of years. We get about uh, $12 million in, in building aid. Of that, uh, 2.25 uh, is the um, local share. We have the allowable levy growth factor. This is the CPI. This year here is 1.26%. This is where 2% comes into play. We can't use anything larger than a 2% figure here. CPI is over 2%. We take out the pilots for 17-18. Notice there's about $128,000 difference. The money there has gone from the pilots to the tax levy. So in order to be even on revenue, we have to raise the, um, the tax levy at least by that much in order to stay even. 
And then we head back to the capital exclusions for this year here. As you see, we're down a little bit there. We are paying off debt. It's a good time to start looking at some other programs in the district. Tax will be down and increase. This is the maximum the district can go up. It's about $2.3 million, just under. And that equals to a 2% tax levy increase from last year to this year here. Okay. Here's the miscellaneous revenues. As you see, pilots is part of that. We have the interest and penalties that we collect on the tax uh, uh, collection. People who pay late and uh, pay the penalties and interest. There's a utility tax on the um, cell phone, uh, telephone bills. We do get reimbursed for expenses that we paid in last year that they uh, do the corrections on. We can get money back from that. Interphone transfers is the, uh, is the rate that we get from our grants to take care of the back office. This is the, uh, the revenue that we, we garner from that. And then there's miscellaneous items like um, the uh, fees that we get in for the athletics, the uh, uh, charging of students, the foster students that are in the district, and the health services are in there. Total miscellaneous is uh, $6.2 million. Just a small part of the revenue, but an important part of the revenue for the district. I'm happy to say there is no budget yet. We're not looking this year to cut items that we've had uh, promised in the other years. So we have a balanced budget of $267,100,000. The revenue can change with the, uh, with the uh, state aid coming out from the, uh, from the legislation, but we'll see that happens in the uh, 1st of April. We have some time to work on that. Budget timeline. Uh, tonight is the uh, draft budget presentation. On the 21st, we'll have the first the, uh, Board of Education discussion on the meeting. The 14th and 21st will be the second and the third. We will also have the superintendent's recommended budget on the 21st of March. Board consideration on the 4th, and we hope I have uh, board adoption on the 19th of uh, April. All paperwork needs to be in the state by the 24th of April. Uh, public hearing is on the May 9th, and the important date that everybody needs to remember is May 16th. Uh, it's the budget vote in the Board of Education election. <coughs> Question. Thank you, Mr. Kern. And so tonight we present the first draft. And as I mentioned when I started, we understand that uh, we've allocated here several opportunities for the board to engage in a public discussion regarding this draft to get us closer to uh, the 21st, where, where I will be presenting the final uh, recommendations to the board. So, Madam President, that concludes uh, my Thank you, Dr. Padilla. We're going to move on to board committee reports, and, and thank you, Mr. Kern, for your report, too. Um, we're going to move to the library committee. Mr. Johnston, please. Thank you. There was a meeting at the library committee on uh, Wednesday, February 1. Library director Thomas presented some attendance numbers for the December 26 and January 2 holidays. Attendance seemed above average uh, for those days. Mr. Thomas reviewed open positions at the library and explained the budget, budget transfer that's on tonight's agenda. Two very popular annual library events are coming up. Uh, the free ARP tax assistance on Tuesdays, which goes on for several weeks. And the annual library book fair uh, is scheduled for May 20 this year. Mr. Thomas presented draft materials for a 2017-18 library budget. And for your information, the current library budget is around $5.6 million. And for the next year, an increase in expenditures of less than 5% is being considered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, personnel committee, Ms. Brokosh? Yes, we had a uh, personnel committee meeting uh, where we discussed the um, sub-administrators needed for exceptional learners, uh, which were um, for the uh, IEP meeting, uh, spring coaching positions, pre-K curriculum planning council appointments, uh, we also discussed extended day programs that are going to be getting at Nettle Hill, New Windsor, and Horizon, some after school, some before school, and um, uh, appointment uh, of a, uh, in the K2 ELL program on Saturday at Kidney Avenue, the need for uh, a teacher because someone um, left and it's a, it's a um, replacement. Uh, we also discussed the uh, draft of the district calendar and then tenure recommendations, and the rest was in executive session. Um, Would you like to go on to the um, the lifting grounds? Yes, yes, we had opening grounds the same day. Uh, we had an update on the uh, security booth 
um, that was built uh, by district at Middle Hill and um, plans for the Temple Hill security booth that's going to be uh, done this spring. Also, um, use of district van uh, and the need for appropriation of, of some more vans uh, to be used in the district. Um, also discuss the work at West Street uh, in the basement and also looking into um, developing a uh, science lab. Uh, we have discussed the, um, the need and the uh, four radios for the district, um, which is something we haven't had in a while. Um, and also facility use requests. Um, we discussed the um, parking um, um, at Dalesgate School and the need for some um, um, new egress and entrance. And that was it. Thank you. We're going to move on to audit and finance. And I'm going to call on Mr. Kern, please. This uh, audit and finance uh, met a little earlier today. We talked about obsolete um, items that would be surplus by the district. Uh, three donations, uh, one of deaths, one of a Lowe's grant uh, for Temple Hill, and a uh, uh, grant from Toyota for uh, Horizons. Uh, we discussed the health and welfare rights for non-resident public schools. Uh, we discussed the RFP for speech-language therapists. And we discussed the um, Big Brothers Big Sister event training agreement and the Cold War uh, uh, veterans and tax exemptions. All these items will be up here next week. Thank you, Mr. Kern. We're going to move on to our Deputy Superintendent, Mr. Forge. Thank you, Madam President. This evening we have one recommendation. It is the recommendations from the CSE and CPSC committees. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Yeah. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Schreiber? Yes. Mr. Devano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. That concludes my items, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Forgett. We'll move on to the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Mrs. Police. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening. We have one item this evening for CNI, and that is the resolution to approve conference requests. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So moved. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Vanell? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stridiron? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Thank you, Madam President. That concludes our CNI items. Thank you, Mrs. Police. We're going to move on to the Assistant Superintendent for Finance, Mr. Kern. Hey, good evening, Madam President. Uh, with the Board's permission, I'd like to uh, amend Resolution 8.1. Uh, it should read, uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Newburgh and Large City School District hereby authorizes Dr. Roberto Padilla, Superintendent of Schools, to purchase three automated professional collecting machines for the school breakfast program for the district from Duchess Restaurant Equipment Company Incorporated for an amount not to exceed $39,308. Funding source AASA School Breakfast Program expansion. I'd like to entertain a motion to amend. Questions or discussion? Roll call. Did you go from four to three? Yes, ma'am. Thank and you. And where's the one? The, the, uh, uh, from one, the council has advised us that the bid went out for three, that we can only award three. We will work within the uh, uh, regular purchasing program to purchase a fourth one, but we will purchase four eventually. Yes. Thank you. Roll we'll call to amend, please. Ms. Mineo? Yes. Ms. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Schreiner? Yes. Mr. Savano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. We have an amended resolution on the floor. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Okay. Question for discussion? Yes. Mr. Um, Schreiner? This is a question about the use of the machines. If, by chance, at the policy, meeting tomorrow, the committee decides to recommend to the full board that caffeinated drinks not be served within the schools for uh, students during the school day. What other use can these machines have? What other drinks can these machines serve besides the espresso drinks? Mr. Kern? 
certainly you know, the plot table sheet. Uh, we, there's several uses that we have for it that we would be able to serve non cap and make a proper choice for that. We would follow policy or the policy of the Could I ask, Ms. Um, Lestarski, to come up and please answer that? Did you get the mic or please? Thank you. So we could uh, we could purchase decaffeinated beans, so it would be the same beverage. We could do it just decaffeinated. Um, additionally, it does just steam milk, so we could add um, some sort of chocolate syrups or something that affects the hot chocolate. Um, but we can do the same latte with drinks, just with decaffeinated beans. Go ahead, Mr. Stratton. Okay, instead of purchasing these machines, is the the um, the grant or the, the program expansion, the school breakfast program expansion money, can that be used for other items instead of this? This, to me, spending forty nine thousand dollars eventually on hot milk machines, I, I think could possibly be used for other purposes. Uh, well, it it can be spent. However, we would like to spend it. We did spend some considerable time um, developing this program to try to figure out a way to entice high school students specifically to come to breakfast. That is pretty much the remainder of the money. We were awarded over $200,000. So many of our elementary and middle schools are pretty much fully equipped with the money that we have already spent. And this is the remaining balance. And again, we you know, looked into ways to try to specifically target the high school population. Any other questions or comments? Just a comment. Uh, in the weekly, this past week, we shared with you a national report that highlights the good work that is taking place in the district around our, our food program. Uh, so I, I fully endorse this uh, resolution. Uh, this is a strategy that we're trying as a district to, as Ms. Um, Lazarski said, to entice more high school students to participate. Uh, we're making Great progress, but we still have a gap, and we think that this might um, be more appealing to the adolescent child. Mr. Howard? Yes, Madam President, uh, to Mr. Starsky. Were there any uh, studies done uh, that got us to these machines? Were there any type of uh, research done with the students, what they might like, what they, you know, any type of uh, information that was used that got you to these machines? Uh, when we originally were introduced to the machines, we were working with the uh, National Dairy Council and uh, and the grant funders. So uh, we were with within that grant. We meet a couple times a year with the other districts that were funded and kind of brainstorm some ideas around what works for high school students. And it seems to be a struggle with many districts. <laughs> uh, you know, high school students are just a difficult moving target, right? So. Um, the Dairy Council has, has done some testing with these, not this specific machine, but with some latte beverages, again, getting kids to consume more milk. Um, there are some districts, not locally, but other districts that are using these machines that I'm sure we could get their feedback and their studies from, but um, you know, the overreaching data that we're looking at is that kids in that high school age range are not consuming enough calcium or not consuming, consuming enough milk. This is a way to get them to drink it, and you know, nationally studies will show that many high school students are already drinking, you know, some sort of a um, not necessarily caffeinated beverage, but some sort of coffee specialty drink. It's trendy. Thank you, Mr. Strudan. Has there any thought been put to serving the student homeless population, as far as using this grant money to provide them with a meal before they go? back to the shelter that they may live in? So this, this funding is specific to breakfast and breakfast initiatives. We do have um, other programs that we do run. Right now we're running um, the after school um, supper program at Temple Hill, Meadow Hill, and um, South Junior High with the Boys and Girls Club. So they do get a third meal and we're looking into expanding that program to any of our other after school sites. And that's kind of a, it's just a different funding structure, but it wouldn't require grant funding necessarily. It just comes under USDA. Thank you. 
Just one more piece on that. We also prepare uh, several hundred book bags every Friday filled with food for kids to take home. I have one comment to make. Your, your presentation last meeting and at the last finance committee was excellent. If anything that can get high school kids to drink milk is really worthwhile, having you know low calcium levels myself, it, you know you don't want kids to grow up to be like me and fracture everywhere. So uh, I think it's a good thing. Thank you. Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Broca? Yes. Mr. Spinner? Yes. Mr. Devano? Yes. Mr. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nail? Yes. Item 8.2. Resolution to authorize the superintendent to purchase equipment from Primark Strategic Equipment. I'd like to maintain motion, please. So moved. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Spinner? Yes. Mr. Devano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Item 8.3, resolution to transfer funds for the uh, Newburgh Free Library. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. Second. Questions for discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark? Mr. Devano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Mr. Yeah. Item 8.4, resolution to approve facility use here questions. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. So moved. Questions for discussion? Roll. Yes, Mr. Stridar. I believe there was a question actually in the building the grounds regarding the elite boxing club. Have they been answered? Yes. Just to clarify the long seat here. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Will any of the proceeds from that event go to the schools? We're making a donation to the school, and they are paying the um, uh, the um, fees for the um, buildings. Did the donation the percentage of the total revenue? Uh, it was a dollar amount. It was a, a ton of amounts. It was uh, uh, put into the end of the resolution. Thank you. Mr. Howard? Yes, Madam President. And we're going to ask the Hooky League. Boxing club. I think that we need to sit and understand. Those children are children from our school district, and that program is an incredible program they run over there. And if anything, I look at some of the equipment that the young kids do over there. I think that any money that is raised, they should keep to buy their equipment. Because them children, I see the children over there working with the cooking and boxing. It's taking kids off the street, and look all that's going on in our community today with young people. This program should be supported effortlessly in anything we can do. So as far as making a donation back, I'm not in favor of that. I think that the money that they do raise, they should put it back into their organization, get better equipment for the kids to operate on. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Ms. Maneo? Yes. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stridiner? Yes. Mr. Bonner? Yes. Madam President, that concludes uh, finance for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kern. We're going to move on to the Assistant Superintendent for Human Res Resources, Mr. McLemore. Thank you, Madam President. Um, on item 9.1 on the HR agenda, item uh, 828, on the professional side, we have appointments, the absence, return from the absence. Resignation and retirement. And on the civil service side, we have appointments, change of status, leave of absence, resignation, retirement, and former employees who have passed away. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. So moved. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Mr. Nayo? Yes. Mr. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stridiron? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yeah. Item 9.2 is a resolution to approve the sub-administrator for exceptional learners. I'd like to see a motion, please. Okay. Okay. Questions for discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Mr. Nail? Yes. Mr. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stridiron? Yes. Mr. Devano? Yes. Mr. Abito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. 
Item 9.3, resolution to approve curriculum planning council for a 12 appointments. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So Questions or discussion? Mr. Johnston? Could, uh, could we get a little background information on uh, the work that this group will do? Ms. Willis? As submitted to the BOE weekly recently, the NECSD Curriculum Planning Council is a group of pre K through grade 12 teachers that will be paid, but in addition, there will be voluntary administrators and others who are interested in helping us think through hot topics that need resolution. Uh, beginning tomorrow, a survey will be posted on our website, our landing page, so that students, parents, community members, and faculty and leaders of the district can surface for us the hot topics that we as a community see we need to prioritize, discuss, and then make possibly either policy and or resource recommendations to the superintendent for his consideration in discussing with the board president. There will be more information during tomorrow's curriculum committee meeting. Thank you. Actually, I'm curious about uh, the participation of students and parents. So will they participate in the actual in the meetings or will their participation be through surveys and other means? It will be both. So there's opportunity for folks who don't, who prefer to participate through surveys to go online and just click off anonymously. In addition, if there are any students and other members, they can join us for the meetings. However, the only individuals who will be paid for participation for two hours per month beginning in February and ending in May are the teachers. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Mayo. Yes. Mr. Rokoff. Yes. Mr. Stringer. Yes. Mr. Tabano. Yes. Mr. Ambito. Yes. Mr. Howard. Yes. Mr. Johnston. Yes. Item 9.4 is a resolution to approve 2016-17 spring athletic coaching appointments. I'd like to see a motion, please. Questions or discussion? Yes. Yes, I'd like to have uh, the fifth one uh, table because uh, all the information is not in yet. So you would like to remove item number five out of that list? Uh, can I have a motion to amend, please? Second. Okay. Questions or discussion? Yes, sir. Do we know what items are not submitted yet? I, I don't know what the items are. Ms. Prokash had some questions and, um, and they weren't fully answered, so she'd like to hold this one off until the next meeting, the next week. which is next week. Um, roll call, Mr. Clerk. Sir, move number five. Mr. Stringer? Yes. Mr. Tabano? No, number five. Eight. Ms. Amita? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaj? Yes. So we have a resolution on the floor without item number five. Any questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Brokaj? Yes. Mr. Spinner? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Amita? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Item 9.5 is a resolution to approve horizons before school program appointments. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Oh. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Ambito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stradire? Yes. Item 9.6 is a resolution to rescind the appointment and approve an additional K-2 ELL Saturday Academy at GAMS appointment. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So, 
Questions or discussion? Yes, it's for clarification. This is not an addition. This is just a replacement. Thank you, Ms. Prokosh. Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Prokosh? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Item 9.7 is a resolution to approve acting principal at Foster Town. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Questions for discussion? Yes, Mr. Stradar. Was this a posted position or is it a different category? This is uh, for a leave. It's not a vacant position. It's an acting. Any other questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Prokop? Yes. Mr. Stradiron? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Item 9.8 is a resolution to approve acting principal at Vail's Gate. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. Second. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Schmidow? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Item 9.9 .9 is a resolution to approve the salary increase of an for an employee. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. I'll move. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Mr. Min Ms. Rokoff? Yes. Mr. Stridiron? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Ambito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Item 9.11 is a resolution to approve the SMOA with NASA. Mr. McElroy, can you do 9.10, please? Yes, yes thank you. It's okay. I'm sorry. Keep me on track. Uh, item 9.10 is a resolution to authorize the superintendent to direct an independent medical exam of an employee. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Question for discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Schmidt-Iron? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. Ms. Ambito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Item 9.11 is a resolution to approve uh, the SMOA with NASA. I'd like to see a motion, please. Questions for discussion? Mr. Yes. Um, I, I feel that um, <clears throat> This is not an equitable thing with uh, other administrators and other buildings that are doing the same sort of work. Um, and I've asked before, but I, um, so I'm not in favor of it, but just to let you know. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Stradine? Just as a follow-up to Ms. Brookhouse said, is it, is it true that the administrators at the elementary and the middle school level do this work for no additional compensation? Dr. Padilla? That is correct. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Schmidt-Iron? No. Mr. Tabano? No. Ms. Ambito? No. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Maneo? Yes. Ms. Prokosh? No. That uh, resolution fails. Item 9.12 is a resolution to approve tenure recommendations. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So moved. Second. Question for discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Yes, Mr. Stradiron. Just as an information for the public, how, in, how much in advance does the board receive notification of a tenure vote for an employee? Can you repeat that question, please? For the public's knowledge, when does the when does the board receive the information regarding when an employee is to receive tenure officially? Mr. Mack, can you answer that, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Iron, That information is given to the board sometimes a month or two months or even three months in advance. Any other questions or discussion? <coughs> yes, sir. I just, just know uh, that at our personnel committee meetings, we always ask if everything is in the file up to date 
And if anybody, um, not only the personnel, but anybody on the board that wants to look at um, the information is, is able to do that in the human resources office. Any other questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Mr. Tavano? Yes. Ms. Ambito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnston? Yes. Ms. Vanejo? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Stradiner? Yes. That concludes my items, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLemore. We're moving on to the clerk of the board, Mr. McCoy. Thank you, Madam President. I have the approval of the minutes from the January 26, 2017 meeting. I'd like to obtain a motion, please. Questions or discussion? Roll call, Mr. Clark. Ms. Amito? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Vanell? Yes. Ms. Brokaw? Yes. Mr. Spinner? Yes. Mr. Tabano? Yes. That concludes my items, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. We're now at the public discussion and comment section on non-agenda items. Please refer to the public comment procedures posted by the signing sheet. Again, issues concerning specific employees, either by name or by identifying reference, will not be tolerated and any violation will result in the speaker being asked to sit down. I do not believe we have anybody signed up, so would anybody like to address the board on non-agenda items? Please come and state your name and where you live, please. Uh, Maria Ramirez, born and raised in Newburgh, New York, part of the Newburgh and Large City School District. Um, and I have my fellow um, friends, teammates, co-workers, um, Andrew and Andrew, uh, Derani Reynoso, and Connor Henderson. Um, so what I'm here tonight to do is basically see what is being done for the LGBTQ youth in our school districts and also to see who I need to connect to, uh, follow up with, uh, because I want to introduce uh, this amazing work that I've been doing in Poughkeepsie um, with LGBTQ after-school programming. I've done a program already with the Poughkeepsie Public Library, and it had 20 kids, super successful, and I really just want to start that conversation here because it's a very important one, and I remember my experience growing up, you know, being born and raised in Newburgh, um, going through elementary, middle school, and high school, and knowing that there were limited to none, you know, resources uh, when I was growing up. And I was also, last school year, at the NFA PRISM conference, uh, the a GSA, the Gay Shared Alliance Club at the high school, and they are doing some phenomenal work, and I would love to um, support them with whatever that may look like. And I want to start that conversation. Thank you. And I'm not supposed to say anything, but I will. Somebody will contact you after, after the meeting, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address the board? Thank you, Madam President. I want to apologize. I did come to my meeting with but I've been going all day, and I rushed here to get back to the meeting. But uh, something I, I was not able to do today, but I want to do right now. So, first of all, I want to wish everybody, all the ladies in there, happy Valentine's Day. But there's, but there's a special wish I want to do. I wasn't able to do it because I've been on the road all day. I want to wish my mother, who was sitting in the back, I only had a Valentine's Day. I don't want to wish her a happy birthday. Today's her birthday. Thank you for giving birth to me. I'm going to say how many years ago, because that's how old you are. So we'll just say, have a lovely rest of your birthday, Ma. And uh, you know I love you. Thank you. Hang on, hang on. Let me set the clock. Ready? Thank you. I'm um, Swing, Seven Winter Garden Drive, um, from the Nets of New York. Um, it took me a lot to come here tonight because the subject that I'm going to speak about, it kind of pains me because it, it, it's affecting someone that I love dearly. And the decisions that are being made around these tables about appointments to certain positions 
And I'm not going to be up here being the accuser of anyone, not an accuser of anyone. But it's important when politics and nepotism hurt children. It needs to be said, and a stand needs to be made for the children, especially of the girls' basketball team. I watched someone that I love dearly take a sport that she loves for it to be her torment based on the decisions of the people sitting around this table. And I don't like to come speak at board meetings. It's not something that I like to do, but it's something that as a community member, that votes, I am called to do. It is very important that you understand why do our children have to suffer in these situations for things that they love. Where is their support? Because it's not coming from the individuals around this table. It's actually quite disappointing. And I, I don't want to, I know that things can be fixed. I know that, that, that there's sometimes decisions that are made that, are, that go on in schools all the time that, that the community can't be aware of or nothing can be done. But I think it's important for, for you all to know that people are watching about what's going on and we will be here listening and seeing how these procedures are going to go in the future. It's interesting that we just had a slew of appointments. I wasn't here at the beginning of the meeting, so I could hear if there was any questions about these individuals that got just appointed these positions. But, you know, it's something that I took, it took me a lot because I don't want um, the person that I love to be impacted by me speaking out and saying that something needs to change about this process. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address the board? Buenas noches. Uh, good evening. It's very different from this end. Uh, my name is Karen Mejia. I am a proud parent of a child at Horizons. Thank you guys for the service that you are doing. I wanted to just give um, some general statements, right? Um, I wanted to thank the, um, Dr. Padilla for the presentation that he gave yesterday at the city council table. That's one of the other hats that I wear. I'm the elected official for Ward 1 here in the city of Newburgh. Um, I, with that hat on, we are. I am super excited about being a partner on My Brother's Keeper, and I am more excited about what that means in terms of a collaboration between the municipality and the school district, right? I think that's, um, you guys have the privilege of entering each and every single household in the uh, Newburgh area, right, including the town and New Windsor as well as the city of Newburgh. It's a privilege that you guys have that the municipality does not. So one of the things I'm looking forward to is being able to capitalize and leverage that entry point that you guys have control over that the municipality doesn't to have positive conversations about what we do for the youth in our community. Um, you guys do not have an easy job. I can see that you're starting your conversations about the budget and um, any increase you guys have to debate and think about it substantially, right? From the city of Newburgh's perspective, tax levy, you guys, as you're well aware, 50% or over 50% of our taxes go to the school district. Um, we are also taxed very high from the municipality perspective. So for city of Newburgh residents, any increase to the tax levy from the Board of Education, it is greatly felt and more so, I think, in the years that are coming, especially next year. So I am really looking forward to what you guys will be proposing, what you guys will be debating, and how you will be, I guess the challenges that I'm putting forth is how this board, right, how our education system will be one of the sort of um, shields, right, that local communities are going to have um, under the new administration from the uh, national level at the federal level. So um, I wish I had a crystal ball that could state what the new department head from the education um, is going to do to our system, right, of public education. And I'm really looking for you guys to be that shield, right, those protectors of our children for the education system that we do have here. 
Um, and that's my challenge, not only as an elected official, but also as your neighbor and a taxpayer and a mother. So again, I thank you guys for your service, and um, I will be coming more often to the meetings just to be a partner and be more informed about how we can leverage each other's um, funds and resources that are very limited. So thank you for your service, and um, have a good night, and whatever you're doing to celebrate the uh, V-Day, enjoy. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Mejia. <coughs> Anybody else like to address the board? Lily Howard, um, Newburgh, New York. First and foremost, thank you, son. Uh, I um, recently, a couple of weeks ago, maybe about nine days ago, I was on Facebook and I noted that uh, Catholic Charities had posted uh, something that they were involved with as far as um, running a drive for uh, clothing and things for um, children in the Newburgh district. And I was so uh, surprised when I saw in that uh, article 652 children, they said, within the Newburgh school district are homeless. And so I made a call to Catholic Charities because I, I couldn't believe that. And what she said to me was that they might not be actually in the streets, but they are homeless as far as having their own domicile to reside in. And I was wondering, uh, does the school district in any way, uh, do they go into wherever these children are living to see the actuality of the type of uh, living situation that they're in? Uh, my concern about that is because that has to affect those children in the school district if they don't have a home. Some people have said, well, they might be residing with grandparents or aunts and whatever. But I was wondering, does a school district, I know years ago they used to have someone that would go into the homes and see the type of situations that the uh, children were living in, and I was wondering, is that still being done? And I just have to say I'm overwhelmed about that number. Um, I heard uh, Councilwoman Mejia, there definitely needs to be a partnership launched between the school district and the city of Newburgh, because um, people need jobs. <laughs> uh, household people who are not ha having their own domicile to live in, I'm quite sure, a lot of them are unemployed people. So I um, hope and pray that uh, there is a cohesive uh, relationship established between the city of Newburgh government and the Newburgh City School District. And once again, son, thank you. I thank God. I'm 77 today. And I just thank God. And I also, I also want to say, thinking lately. And I said, you know what? You've been doing a lot of things. I was born and raised in the city of Newburgh. You know what? I think whatever years you have left, maybe you should use those years to try to help the children. Because we talk about the conditions, the violence in the city of Newburgh, but the children, it evolves from the children. So because of that, I said, you know what? I'm going to run for the school board this year. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Johnny Reynoso, and I'm the Student Association President at the State University of New York College at New Falls. Uh, this is my second year being the Student Association President there. And um, I just want to reach out to the Newburgh School District. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a primarily, uh, predominantly um, school district with students of color, correct? OK, so we're facing some diversity issues at SUNY New Falls. And um, I'm graduating in May, but before I leave, I want to make sure that I leave this. And, and I've also spoken, uh, I've also spoken to other um, leaders in the area about promoting college to students. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I said uh, I got educated in the 19th um, district, and I wish 
I really wish that the people that um, were in charge of that kind of sector um, did more to encourage students to attend college. So, um, especially students of color who, in this kind of like political climate, probably feel kind of out of control in that kind of situation. So, I just want to challenge the Newburgh School District and the Board of Education to encourage more students to attend college. SUNY New Paltz has very high expectations, but we have the Educational Opportunity Program that um, accepts students uh, with um, that are that don't really meet the expectations of SUNY New Paltz, but have potential to. I personally was accepted through the Education Opportunity Program, and you know that gave me a chance, and now I'm the student government president. So um, definitely believing in students, encouraging them to attend school. If you need, if you want us to give college tours to students and working with the high schools in the area, we can do that. Um, but definitely um, my goal here is to extend uh, the possibility of higher education to all students, um, especially students in the Ulster School District, the Newburgh, Poughkeepsie, et cetera. So um, just challenging you all to encourage students to seek higher education and meet their goals. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else that would like to address the board on non-agenda items? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby recesses into executive session for the following purpose. Matter made confidential under FERPA, employment history of particular individuals, matter leading to the employment of particular individuals, the review of programs and placement of students with disabilities, and collective bargaining under Taylor Law, NTA, CSCA, NASA, and to obtain advice from legal counsel. I would like to entertain a motion, please. Roll call, please. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Medeo? Yes. Ms. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Baird? Mr. Schneider? Yes. Mr. Devano? Yes. Mr. Chamizo? Yes. We will not be conducting business after executive session.